night, and she had to go to the hospital. New specialist Peter Seymour joins us live with this unusual story. The coyote could have been spooked into an unfamiliar van, or so hungry that it hoped that the security guard would be an easy meal. Regardless, coyotes don't usually act like this. I was raised in Wyoming on a large commercial sheep operation. We had probably about 4,000 head of sheep that ranged on the public lands in Wyoming. One of my jobs as a kid when I was growing up there was they would bring orphan lambs home to me on the ranch and I would bottle feed them. Come on, girl. Come on. This is a more intensive operation. It's more hands-on. When you do a commercial operation, you don't get to handle the lambs like we do here, but each and every one of them we get to handle and, and work with, and you do become a little bit more attached. They have names. This is Wheezy. They're significant value in what we do. Uh, they're just not a product. They're, they're alive, they're living, and uh, you hate to see them hurt. If a coyote comes in and gets a lamb or a kid goat, they're gone. This is Chad. Uh, just letting you know, they went out this morning and found three, three lambs that were coyote killed that happened last night. Uh, I know it's just anecdotal evidence or whatever you call it, but it, it, that's what happened. They've got the lambs up there and the trapper will go up and get on them. I don't want coyotes all dead. I just don't want coyotes killing my animals. That's as simple as it is. I didn't grow up hating coyotes. I grew up hating the fact that coyotes are killing my sheep. I guess we, we work to coexist together, but I don't want them. I don't want them killing my sheep. That has to be understandable. We talk to the herders. Uh, we compensate the herders every time they kill a coyote. We don't want them hunting coyotes. They gotta be watching the sheep, but, uh, but they'll go out and if they get a coyote, they bring us a tail and, and we'll, uh, we'll compensate them. The bounty program uh, incentivizes people to go out and, and hunt coyotes and shoot them. I've never honestly participated in the bounty program. But I think the bounty program, if it takes more coyotes, uh, then it's, it's helpful to me. Coyotes are extremely smart animals. They know when you're moving in on them. They know they can sense when their existence is being threatened. You take a shot at a coyote once and you may never get a second shot. They become educated very fast. And so new bounty hunters that come out sometimes do a great job of educating the coyotes. They don't do quite as great a job of killing them. I think 
a lot of the idea is really removing coyotes from the landscape in the hopes that it'll help deer and then maybe even have side benefits on livestock and those species too. They're all in the same range. Whether or not it's helping is something where the jury's still out. If people are thinking that we're gonna remove all coyotes from Utah or the West, that's not gonna happen. The research is really strong on this one that if you wanna reduce coyote populations, you need to remove 70% of the animals from a given area for a few years in a row. They're incredibly reproductive. They bounce back really quickly. So just sheer numbers, there's so many coyotes that have to be taken to have any impact on the population statewide. It's not so much people have moved into the coyotes' homes as we've created nice places for them to live. Something with food and cover. Coyotes historically were known to live in the Southwest US. There's been a lot of changes um, since those times. The way land use is done, things like agriculture, they do quite well in. You put out that many sheep on the landscape, they'll take advantage of that. They're very individual in the sense that if there's a certain condition where a coyote can live, there will be a coyote out there that'll find a way to live in that condition. They'll adapt to urban areas, they'll adapt to rural areas. So because of that, they've spread and extended their range from South America up to, you know, Alaska, essentially, and all the way to, from the West Coast to the East Coast, and they show up in places like Central Park now and again. In urban environments, we sort of almost encourage coyotes to hang with us. We, we do landscaping, we have irrigation, we have fruit trees, we have, open spaces that we've preserved within these sort of oases and it's almost and then we when we see coyotes we tend to either di dismiss them or actually be excited about it and take a picture with our phone or some people actually encourage them to come closer and so if you think about that difference that that urban coyote probably has a very different sense of what the presence of human beings are from a rural coyote how you test that and research that gets very complicated for sure So we're inside the predator research facility in a lab where we're keeping some young pups that were born in the wild. The mother of this litter um, was caught depredating on some sheep and was lethally removed from an area where non-lethal tools hadn't been working. And after they removed her, they found the den because there was evidence that she had had pups and was lactating. And so um, we were able to find the den and get these pups and use them as part of our captive facility now. I got started in coyote research a long time ago. Uh, I did my PhD on coyotes. I knew pretty much at a young age that I wanted to work something with animals and outdoors, but as a child, I thought that meant you were a veterinarian. We do a lot of different things here at the Predator Research Facility. We have about 100 adult coyotes in captivity that we use to look at different issues to reduce human wildlife conflicts. And we do that through a number of experiments, both here with captive animals and then also with wild animals. When you talk about metro areas, there's two coyote camps. One camp is very adamant, they don't belong here, we should shoot them all and get rid of them and, and everything will be fine. And there's another camp that's very much, we love the coyotes, we took their habitat, they were here first, we need to just live with them and by the way, we love them. And, and I think the biggest challenge about what we do as researchers and what we do as educators is bringing those two camps together because actually neither are very correct. In the 90s, they had a, a group of people that identified themselves as members of the Animal Liberation Front that came to our facility and tried to release coyotes from their pens. And I think they might have used fire as a distraction while they were releasing coyotes. It 
it was not very successful. For one thing, these coyotes are born and raised here, and so these are their territories, and so most of them didn't want to leave their pens since the gates were open. Um, they're also very territorial animals, so the ones that did get out and get into somebody else's territory fought. The facility had to put down a lot of coyotes that were injured from fights within coyotes. So it ended up being quite a bit of a tragedy for the staff that had to work here through that time. Seventeen years ago, I got my first horse and started riding out here in Aurora, Colorado. Through riding on the trails, I met a group of people that were going to construct a trail, and so I became their first equestrian trail steward. Well, I've had training and first aid and, and how to communicate with the public about the nature in Aurora, including the geology, the coyotes, the biology. The sad things I've seen on this trail, our friend back here, I found him when he had been shot. He was dead already, but it was a fresh kill. And I called the park ranger immediately to let them know that someone had been into the open space with a gun, which was against the law, and had killed one of our coyotes. You just can't be shooting in guns in the city of Denver. Coyotes really do respond to hazing. You make yourself big and you yell and you clap your hands at them. You can actually chunk rocks at them. Don't go after to hit them, but scare them enough and, and let them know they're not welcome in your yard or on your street. And, and they usually will take off. As the coyotes move closer to the city and the human population doesn't understand hazing, then the coyotes start picking up other behaviors. They start looking for cats. They start looking for dog food bowls. Um, I hate to say this, but we have a lady in our neighborhood that actually has a heated pet bed for a coyote to sleep in on cold days. If they will haze the coyotes and keep them in the urban corridor, the streams, then the coyotes will stay down there and eat the rabbits and the voles and the prairie dogs like they're supposed to and not friskies. <laughs> we do have people that don't like to have any lethal removals going on or lethal tools being used. We also have you know, some people that don't want any non-lethal tools being used. So I figure as long as there's people unhappy with me on both sides of the issue, then I'm doing a pretty good job at my job because I'm finding that balance where we can use a majority of non-lethal tools and only incorporate those lethal tools when it's the absolute you know, final answer. When we send our animals out on the mountains uh, during the summer uh, months, they're, they're on their own. We send along with them uh, guard dogs. They have really helped us uh, tremendously. Uh, they're, they work really well on coyotes. They actually work a little more in the nighttime than they do in the daytime. And so at night, uh, that's when many of the predators are most active. The other measure we like is, uh, uh, is the llama. The llamas, of course, can graze right with them because they're, uh, they're gonna be on the same kind of a diet, which gives us a real opportunity to use those and have them with them 100% of the time. And they're, they're enough of a dominant force that uh, often that'll just end the, the situation. But it's not 100% by any stretch. It's no great joy for us to kill an animal, whether it's a predator, uh, whether it's to put down on one of our sheep that's been injured or a meat goat that's been torn up from a predator, from a coyote. We find no joy in any of that. We'd be much happier if we could just go about applying research, improving our wool quality or whatever the production issue is. We'd be much happier doing those things than we would be controlling predators but we have to somehow figure out a way to survive 
and controlling coyotes is one of those key factors for us this year and for the future. For urban families, I totally understand rural coyotes and that they can be a problem. I totally understand that. I'm, I was brought up in the country. But for urban people, they just need to learn and listen. Just follow the rules. That would be the only thing that I would share, is just be mindful of our wildlife, but let's embrace them and educate ourselves and live in peace. <laughs> Here's the, the secret here <laughs> about wildlife management. Uh, wildlife management's really a misnomer. It's about managing people. And a lot of the way these ways the animals are easy. We, we know the biology, we kind of know what makes their, them, them tick. We know the numbers of coyotes that we'd have to remove in order to get rid of them, for instance. We know that we're not gonna be able to get there. What wildlife managers have to do is walk that tightrope between the two. This predator paradox is this issue where we want it all. We want healthy deer populations. We want livestock to be unharassed. But we also want nature. We want you know, predators on the landscape. And that's a really difficult balance to achieve. The fact is predators kill things for a living. That's what they do. Coyotes kill things. It can be devastating especially for individuals. The challenge is to figure out how are we gonna have all these animals, but who's gonna bear the cost of it?